a brief intro. I'm going to uh, post everybody's um, information here in the chat so you guys can all see it. I'll send it out to everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I actually look after. So I look after the American market and a bit of South America. I also look after Australia, New Zealand. So I'm either up at eight o'clock in the morning and then going about at 2 a.m. And they put me at either side of the globe. So and I, I look after some of Europe as well. So the likes of Austria, Malta, Croatia, Czech Republic, um, Russia. So I've done a fair bit of traveling with the Shed Distillery, bringing Drumshambo Gunpowder Irish Gin, which is our main brand. Um, and then we also have our whiskey, which is Drumshambo Single Pot Still Irish Whiskey, which I always keep a bottle behind me. Um, as you can see, it's 12 o'clock in the morning over here, and I've been up early, so I've gotten through a fair whack of this whiskey, and just to wash it down with a bit of gin. So yeah, um, that's pretty much my background with the Shed Distillery, as it is, um, multi-purpose distillery. So as we said, make whiskey, um, gin, and vodka, but we're all here for gin, um, which is our number one setter. We've so, actually completely forgotten what those other spirits even J during this, the, <laughs> you know, the hour we have together, we don't even know what those other spirits are, Good. but yeah. Good. Um, we're sold out of the rest of them. So. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, as I said, Alex is, um, is ill today and can't join us, but um, I wanted to make sure that you had his information here anyway, and I'll be making my 50, 50 with uh, four pillars just in his stead. Cause he can't be here. But I would like to also, and, and um, Alex is the one person for Four Pillars Gin in the United States. So he's a lone Australian from one island on another island by himself right now in North America. Um, I would like to also introduce Simon Ford, who I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but he's the guy be behind Ford's Gin. Um, <laughs> I know it doesn't really seem to match very well, but... Somehow they seemed, they named him after the gin, which I thought was really cool. Um, Simon, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? Someone with a thumbs up. Just perfect. Um, I, I think um, this is a bold statement to put out there on a, on, on a call like this. But I think I love gin more than anybody else in the world. I'm pretty sure. And... Um, and that, and, and that love that started from legal drinking age um, and, and led us right up to this moment is sort of, you know, er, er, all of that time period has sort of led to the creation of, uh, of, of Ford's Gin. But um, it, it really started when um, an interesting gentleman by the name of Charles Rolls um, offered me a job back in the 90s don't want to put an age to myself too much, but uh, uh, for a, a distillery, which was the oldest gin distillery in um, in England, uh, I think it's the oldest gin distillery in the world, Plymouth Gins Distillery, and uh, he he would um, put me in charge of launching uh, Plymouth Gin uh, around the world for several years, and that was when I really you know had access to the archives upstairs in the um, in the distillery and started really putting together the the history of gin for myself and 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 learning all that I could uh, on the category and um, and that was fun because that gentleman by the name of Charles Rolls sold um, Plymouth gin and he, he he took over that distillery in 97 with a few other people he sold it in 95 uh, sorry in 2005. Um, he would have to have a time machine to have sold it in '95, of course. So in 2005, he sold sold it, and 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 I thought that that was one of the most um, influential things that anyone could offer the gin industry. Um, he went uh, and outdid himself by launching Fever Tree next. So uh, his he 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 he's he's done good. He's done all right. <laughs> um, and so, but um, so, but it was really sort of nice to get to work on 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 Plymouth all of those years, and then around sort of 2008 2009, I'm sort of starting to help other people because of all I'd, I'd learned at Plymouth, launch gins, and it was a gentleman who was a bartender by the name of Sasha Petrosky that really sort of persuaded me to 
put my gin knowledge to creating a gin that, you know, essentially we felt we were making something that would be great for bartenders, something that bartenders would want to use. And um, between us, we sort of created this journey. I will say right now that it was his idea to call it forward. It's not mine, I promise. I, <laughs> no matter how egotistical I come across to everyone tonight, which I hope I don't, but um, one of the things I did not do is name the gin after myself. That was very much a... Um, uh, uh, everyone else's decision that I was uh, partners with in business who felt that I should have my name. And if anyone ever wants to know why there isn't an apostrophe in the Ford's gin, it's because I was in charge of the label. So I sort of took out the possessive part of it. So I don't think it quite works. I'm going to have to change my name, really, if it's to, to do anything. I can't change the name of the gin at this particular particular point. <laughs> I think, but, I think we're, yeah, fine. Have we're fine with it. Reprint labels, so you might as well just keep it right, the apostrophe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or honestly, you can borrow the apostrophe from Connor. He's got an extra one. Yeah, he does. <laughs> That'll work out quite nicely. Um, so, uh, Connor, what do you have in your glass? And and I've let's dive into nothing. Into just a, a bit of ice water at the moment. And um, so, fifty fifty martini. These are something I used to always kind of. I always used to have around, and um, and I always find the problem with a bottle of vermouth was it's 14 martinis of your full 700 ml bottle of vermouth. So I used to grab a load of these kind of jars and make the 50-50 in the jar and just store them in the freezer. Nice. So the vermouth actually lasts a lot longer. It means you don't have to drink 14 martinis in a single sitting. Wait, um, whoa, hold on a second. Why not? <laughs> I've tried it. Okay. Probably no when I was 16. Still regret it. <laughs> but yeah, so literally, so I pre-batched um, a load of these. I made it extra because I heard this call could go on for a while. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I used 50 mils or 60 mils and um, two ounces in US terms of from Shambo Gunpowder Irish Gin. Um, and then I used a Vermouth, an Italian Cockney uh, Americano because we're in America today. So I decided to go with the Americano vermouth. Uh, really, really lovely, sweet tones from it. I think it really, really complements the uh, Drumshambo Gunpowder Irish Gin. So simple as, pour it into the glass. And then just to add a bit of bitters, I'm using a Irish made bitters actually that I was given. And um, it's an Irish marmalade citrus bitters. Hold those closer to your camera so everybody can see. It's called off the, off the cuff marmalade citrus. Yum. And um, really, really good bitters made here in uh, Dublin. So a little simple two dashes, uh, three for luck. Uh, quick question. Is there a reason that you don't put the bitters in when you pre-batch? Or is that just because? I'm a real kind of a mood kind of cocktail person. Um, I kind of tailor my cocktails and kind of what mood I'm in. Uh, bad mood heavier on the gin, lighter on the vermouth. Um, good move, long summary kind of cocktails. But I like experimenting with bitters. So I never know what kind of bitters I want. Like I always keep a, a couple of things like the bitter truth, the grapefruit bitters, which works really well with our gin because we, we actually vapor infuse infuse um, all our fresh citrus. So we're putting fresh grapefruit, fresh lemons, fresh limes um, in the vapor still. So we get a really, really bright, fresh citrus taste from the gin. So the grapefruit bitters just kind of elevates that um, flavor. Do, do you, um, are you doing a swath of any, um, any fruit on the top? Are you doing any citrus oil of any kind? Yeah, so I actually went out to go get grapefruits today. But we got this kind of thing, um, Simon might know about it, called Brexit at the moment, <laughs> which is near impossible to get grapefruits here in Ireland. Um, I can see Simon covering up his face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the I'm having trouble shipping gin to Germany right now. I, I, there's new paperwork to fill out, and I hate any paperwork. Just, oh, but... so I'm, Simon, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> Someone today goes, can you ship this to the United Kingdom? And I was like, oh, it'd be actually quicker for me just to drive it over with the amount of paperwork you got to do now. <laughs> yeah. 
Sometimes, uh, sometimes I look at what they want to charge for, for shipping and that's even domestically in the U S and I literally like, you know, grab up my phone. I'm like, I probably could fast more quickly and less expensively take it there myself. Yeah. And you know what? Hey, trip to New York. Maybe I'll just do that. Why not? <laughs> And especially like we get so many requests in from the US, can you ship me your whiskey or can you ship me your gin? Or we just brought out a, a new gin, um, which we're using um, Sardinian citrus in it. So uh, Monterosa, which is a really, really lovely uh, citrus from Sardinia. Uh, but people have been emailing in, can you ship it? And I was like, where are you based? And they're like, Utah or somewhere. And you're like, <laughs> I'm never getting the bottle there. Listen, uh, in the U.S., we can't even get it into Utah sometimes, so that's not no. really a stretch. Yeah. So, I like I love trying. I'm I'm asked for a forgiveness then permission kind of guy, but it just does not get through nowadays. So, back to fruit. Um, I'm just using simple, just a little carving of orange peel. Um, bring out. Lovely kind of flavors, kind of brings out that lovely marmalade citrus. Um, Cause I also do, I love a breakfast martini for breakfast, even though it's around <laughs> breakfast time now. But uh, no, so that's the kind of, I went with that kind of like lovely kind of citrus forward kind of style of martini and um, really, really fresh, especially the oranges we're actually getting. I don't know where they've got them from cause they definitely didn't grow them here in Ireland cause it's mid twenties and Fahrenheit here. So, um, but whatever they are, they're really, really gorgeous smell. And um, even cutting the fruit there earlier on, my whole kitchen egg kind of smells of just fresh citrus. Um, so that is my martini. So cheers, everyone. Awesome. Cheers, cheers to you. Anyone who has one ready to go, I would just dive in. Looks like, like Doug's ready to go. Not a martini glass, Doug, but I still, it's probably still pretty good. No problem. Um, and the and the metal cups keep it nice and cold, so that's great. Um, I have my like I'm waiting for Simon to do his, and then I'm gonna I'm just keeping my coop filled with um, pebble ice just to keep it super chilled. All right, Simon, take it away. So I, I, I don't have a jigger with me, so it might not officially end up being a fifty fifty. It's gonna be uh, the the best I can I, I can muster at the at this at this moment. Forty seven fifty threes are perfectly acceptable. <laughs> or, or if you have two seven hundred mil bottles, if you just pour them both together you get He's absolutely feet. right. The, and this is where the problem is uh, is occurring, Connor, because I don't I, I ended up with a <laughs> so um uh, so it's good, but we're going to do the, the best to make a 50-50, a but I, I, I thought I would sort of experiment a little bit. Uh, I've done this before um, with different ratios, but just using a little bit of um, the uh, the Blanc vermouth and the dry vermouth, so that it's just to add a little bit of sweetness in. So this, this will be a, a first, so I will be letting everyone know what I think of this particular ratio. Um, it's going to be, I guess that makes it a 50-25-25. Now, interesting kind of you know, sort of part of my journey in gin really was, I think it, it's, it's back in 97, 98, I get, um, I, I get a, a, a gig, it was kind of a cool gig, driving some very well-known, uh, then well-known British bartenders around England in a Diamante car, uh, where they were called the Hit Squad, and they would go into bars and they would teach everyone how to make drinks. And back then there wasn't, um, in England, a a sort of a, a, a big cocktail culture and people didn't know the basics like use a lot of ice how to make a stir a martini things like that in fact i believe back then if you asked for a, a martini you'd have probably got martini and rossi in a glass and ice if you were lucky so um so these bartenders uh, set off around to to teach everyone how to make mar martinis and old fashions and manhattans and, and the likes and I, I happen to be the, 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 the designated driver. But um, I did learn how to bartend on this trip. And, and what was interesting about martinis back in 97 in England is they were so dry. Like the trend was as dry as you could get. But they did honor vermouth. And there was all these different things. And so the way I was taught to make a, a martini was to actually, they called it I, like... Um, 
seasoning the ice. So you would pour the vermouth on the ice into your shaker, stir it around, and then you would discard of the vermouth, which is a tremendous waste, but that was kind of how we were being taught at the time. And, um, and then you'd add, it, add in the gin, stir, pour, you know, and it was, it was done great. So I grew up in an environment of dry martinis. You know, fast forward to meeting Audrey Saunders, and I, I started coming to New York. Um, and the first uh, apartment that I ever rented in New York was the Upper East Side, and so I was near, near the Bemelman's Bar where she was. And, um, and all of a sudden, and she didn't make me a 50-50 at this particular point, but she's definitely going, hey, have a two-to-one martini. And that's what she was making. I'm like, you know what? Vermouth is good. Now, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, Donna, you might, you, you might remember when in bartender history, we started putting vermouth back in the fridge, but it was that moment that actually we started making martinis with vermouth again properly and they were good. I mean, I think that it was our ignorance on how to keep vermouth that led to the dry martini in the first place. Just a theory, but that, that could be it. So, so, so my experience of um, being introduced to wet martinis, as it, as it were, would be, would be through uh, Audrey Saunders. And of course, when she opened the Payu Club, bang smack on that menu was the fitty fifty. Fitty fitty. I can't I can't say it. I, I I can try. It's very hard <laughs> in an English accent. You know? It's like uh, but the fifty fifty, I'll say fitty fitty. It, it just i i I've I'm struggling with the fitty fitty bit. Um so I'm gonna call it the fifty fifty for the sake of of, uh, of of the accent and and um that was my first experience with it. And I think that we have, I obviously know that we're, I'm surrounded and in good, in good company of martini connoisseurs. And I think the first thing anyone notices about martinis, and you sort of alluded to a little bit, Connor, is 50-50s are a little bit more sessionable than dry martinis. As in, you know that rule about, you know, one martini's never enough and three's too many? That's not the case with 50-50 martinis, right? You can sort of, you know, stretch, stretch the evening along yeah, Simon. Martinis, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't arbitrarily say seventeen. Seventeen was like a real number that he chose oh, right. based on experience. <laughs> I don't have the Irish genes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Simon, I am our, going our to fifty-fifty is multiplied by two. So <laughs> three's not enough. Six is too many. I I, I do love those. You know, uh, I I the, all of the you know one's not enough. Three's too many. Yeah, six is too many. So I'm gonna eyeball a fifty-fifty martini right now. But I'm going to go in with the dry Dolan vermouth that did come from the fridge, kept properly. And you're using, you're using going, Dolan dry? Yeah, and I'm going to use some of the uh, Dolan Blanc as well, just add a little awesome. bit of sweetness for this particular one. So um, it was what was it already open. I'm going to be honest. I love Dolan, and so it does get my endorsement, but I love vermouth. And one of the things that you'll find in the Ford house is lots of different vermouths, you know, and I like and I like to switch it up. The gin I get for free, so I don't switch up the gin so much. But plus, <laughs> I have to, you know. <laughs> and um, I'm going to do the same same as Connor. I've always been a big fan uh, of adding a splash of bitters. I love the idea of marmalade bitters, by the way. But these are just straightforward uh, orange bitters that I got given as a gift um, at this. South African gin show actually I was doing a guest speaking thing there and um, I met these guys that um, made bitters and they gave me that and it was the first again first one I pulled from the bitters drawer so I usually use Regan's um, for my orange bitters. So is, it, or is, it, is it made by the same guys who make Whitley Neal gin or totally separate? They, no no sorry not Whitley Neal mutiny it's called cool. it's uh I've never seen the mouth it, but they, they've got a skull on it and it sort of plays to my heavy metal sensibility. So I'm like, I'm, I'm all, all for it. So, uh, and um, I did my martini glass and doing some things right. <laughs> and um, it's okay. That's literally all I've done. So we're fine. <laughs> well, look at that. Danny, you got that bit down. I want to, I just want to point out, still got it. Like, <laughs> not one drop wasted not, not one, drop. one drop wasted i have and um i'm i'm one for a twist olives on the side right that's always been my sort of motto i think i learned that from 
that you know if anyone has been to london or anyone gets to go to london in the future and you need to go to the duke's bar for what they call a naked martini now that they, they pull the gin from the freezer and they have particularly um uh they only use sicilian lemons um and they did this they do this big peel and it's sort of it's allegedly um that tradition of bringing this cart and the big orange peel is where uh, ian fleming got the idea of the um big garnish for the vesper martini um he used to um by the way cheers cheers to you Good. cheers everybody Okay, while we while we have a minute, I'm going to come back to you guys. While we have a minute, I would like to do a quick intro over here. Um, Donna Katz is our resident Australian since Alex is sick today. Um, so Donna, if you can unmute for a second and just Aussie it up. G'day. <laughs> Good start. So a quick intro. So Donna um, is based in in Napa, and she is a, um, a, a, you know, recovered from the finance world and has decided that she's going to be a, an insanely talented winemaker and also makes a product called G's Ginger Beer, which is a naturally fermented um, ginger beer uh, with no sugar in it. It's fairly insane, but it's basically right now only in, in the Western part of the United States. That being said, She's also proudly Australian and um, is basically like Ridgy Ditch. Oh yeah, sorry. I, I don't even know the terminology. Apparently, it, I sound like Simon trying to say fitty fitty at this point. Um, <laughs> so Donna, I'll let you take it away. And and although she is new to uh, to Four Pillars Gin, um, she has uh, some basic information she wants to share with you in the way that only an Australian can. Ice. Cheers. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very cool to be here. So thanks for having us. Um, Four Pillars is actually obviously from where I'm from in Australia. Um, and from my mates at home, even though I live in California, my mates in Australia, uh, they actually talk about Four Pillars a lot. So they're doing some really great stuff. Um, and uh, next time I go home, when we are post to COVID world, I do look forward to going and connecting with, uh, with the folks down there. So um, what are the four pillars? Is this a Q&A? Am I going into Qs? You're, you're, you're doing the Qs and the A's just to let oh, people know the Qs what the four the pillars are all about. Yeah. Right on. Okay. So four pillars, uh, you know, the, the background around four, four pillars, I don't have the full back story per se, but I do like the fact that like the, the name of the, of the, of, of the beverage um, has some meaning behind it. So what are the four pillars? The four pillars are the stills, the water, and the love. And uh, quite honestly, who doesn't want the latter? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it, people sometimes call love as a botanical, but it just, it depends. Yeah. It's like the sixth sense of sorts. It's the... Well, then it, would be, then it would be six pillars. It would be an entirely different story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm just super glad that you were able to join us because um, uh, Donna Sun, who is Jack Flash Cats or JFK, as we call him, um, is is currently, uh, you said, negotiating a pair, which means He's negotiating that a whole pair to give me an extra few minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, can sh you can show him if you want to swivel. I want to show I the can kid. swivel around. Uh, I'll go this way, and then you can. So I farm this little vineyard back here, and then we go, and there's there's the little guy. Yeah. So we're on what's known as as um, mommy borrowed time right now. So while <laughs> he's negotiating that pair, I figured it would be a good time to get her uh, to get her on to um, you know Aussie it up for us a little bit. Um, Donna, thank you. Please like stick around if you're able to, and we'll come back to you later, which would Pretty be awesome. Nice. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having us. Um, Simon, I forgot to ask both you and Connor, do either of you, like, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to pre-batch beforehand, especially Connor with, like, the little jars, sometimes I'll do it, honestly, in, like, little 100 mil bottles so they're ready to go. Do you pre-dilute as well? Yeah. I do. Okay. I go about 10% water. So that <laughs> This is when you're not stirring it. This is when you keep it in the freezer and just pop it right keep into it in the glass. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, I put. I, I, you know, so if it was a hundred mLs, I, you know, ten percent of that would be water, and so I give it some dilution. 
Okay, and then Connor, what about you? Yeah, I usually just, when I'm making it and putting, especially in one of these jars, just chip it away at a bit of an ice block and just throw an ice into it and it'll just, like usually when you take it out, it just dilutes itself down. Okay. Um, so yeah, Simon. I'm, I'm around, yeah, 10, 15 percent. Okay. Simon, I don't know if you, do you remember Don Lee's dilution experiments where the, like the shake versus the stir and they would measure everything. Do you remember when he did that? I do. That was remarkably geeky. Yeah. And, and also the percentages came out much higher um, for, for stirred drinks than we thought. We thought for sure that the stirred drinks were going to be a lower percentage of dilution naturally than the shaken, just because the shaken you have, uh, you're invigorating the drink and it's just, you know, with that but, rapid but, motion. But Donnie, please, please don't try and start an ice argument here. <laughs> Not here uh, but it was much higher. It was something like 40 some odd percent of dilution with, with the stir. And no one wants that in their martini. And no one needs that. No one needs that. <laughs> like our, our standard for, um, for like, you know, volume accounts or national accounts is usually about 25%. But if you want to keep something uh, and you're doing it at home anyway, you can always add in a couple chips of ice. You can always add in, especially like our new, our new fridge does this, does these like this pebble ice, which is insane. It's like not a small a sonic ice, but it's these really cool um, pebbles um, for so mine, I just really quickly. So we can move on to the next topic for mine. I did, um, uh, I didn't actually have the rare dry, which was our recommendation for the month. I did the four pillars what's called the olive branch gin. Um, they were actually sent a cease and desist by olive branch wine uh, winery in Australia, even though it's very different. There's one that's called olive branch. So they changed it, I think, to olive leaf gin. So if you see these in a store, you should pick them up because it's the last batch that's going to be available. Super interesting savory, which is much more my feel. And then luckily we did something, like all three of us did something different. I went with the Carpano dry and normally... I mean, I was just about to do it was add in a little of the Bianco, but Simon had already done that. And I just decided like to go 50, 50. And then I use Regan's orange bitters, quick stir, um, frozen glass, uh, lemon peel, good to go. And it's, I mean, sessionable is, is a, a good word for it. They're very easy to drink and, and really easy to enjoy. And quite frankly, if you guys, if y'all have like little carafes at home and can keep part of that, in the fridge freezer or on crushed ice, you can constantly just give yourself little coolers in your glass just to keep the drink cold. It's a great steakhouse move, actually. And I, I, I Donnie, one of the things that I'll say is, um, so what, um, Dan Warner, who's a, a colleague of mine, every time I go to his house, he's got a fridge door and it's like, it, I mean, this thing looks like James Bond opened it in his car. Yeah. And there are frozen martini glasses, and he's always got different bottles in there. And he's got his 50 50, and his three to one, and his two to one. Uh, and he's got all of his martini ratios all in the fridge. So um, we put together a little um, an, a, a information on, on, the, on the, the amount of gin, the amount of vermouth, and the amount of water for the dilution. Uh, for the freezer door martini, and we put it in imbibe a couple of times just for uh, for everyone who reads imbibe. But um, um, I, I, I actually, if I send that to you, Donnie, it's something you could share with the community, or we could put it on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, it's, please it's do. Kind of brilliant. If you if you want to pop it into um, the Shaker and Spoon face group, um, Facebook group, that'd be awesome. I'm sure, people okay. would love to see it. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, you know, over the past year people have done some really incredible work to like their home bars. Uh, it's been in very inspiring to watch. Um, and by inspiring, I mean infuriating because I don't have the time to do that, but they look really fun. <laughs> and I'd love to have any of them come over to my place and help build that bar. What is behind me is not real. It is a Mori Amargo. So it's uh, not my home bar, unfortunately. Um, does, what we're going to do moving on is we're going to um, go back to the, to the two gentlemen and have them um, talk about the category of, of gin and, of course, like um, how they differentiate their two products. But we're really focusing more on category than anything else. Uh, and then for those of you who have questions, please feel free to uh, shoot them in the chat and then we'll do a little Q&A after. So, Connor, if you have the, uh, a couple minutes to talk about 
um, shed distillery and and what it is that gunpowder is doing that's that's different uh, I we would love that yeah of course um as Simon says gin is one of my favorite categories there's so much you can do with gins um especially around the world with gins um and believe it or not like the UK massive gin scene so huge and um, but believe it or not Ireland has a really really big gin scene that's kind of come up in the last couple of years and um, there's 56 Irish gin distilleries here in Ireland, believe it or not. 56? Yeah, there's 56. Um, well, the last time I checked, it was 56. Um, so we, we set up um, our distillery on the 21st of December um, 2014, owned by, a, owned by a guy called PJ Rigney, um, who's been in the drinks business I think he's about 40 years now in the drinks business. He uh, started off with a company and um, started launching a brand. You might know it's kind of small. It's called Bailey's Irish Cream. Um, sells a couple of cases around Christmas time. And that's I've, never, I've never heard of it. Is it any good? Nah. Sells, sells a couple of cases to my mom at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's the only time I ever see it sell is like Christmas time or um it's huge like it's the only time i ever have a house it's like oh it's christmas crap i need to get a bottle of baileys get one in um and then it sits in the press for a year but uh yeah so he worked for baileys um, and then he went off and he worked for another irish cream liqueur company called carolyn's irish cream um and then he actually moved back to baileys but he actually left baileys and wanted to set up his own his own alcohol brands so he set up a, a alcohol brand called brew vodka uh, and clantarf whiskey um, which he ended up uh, selling in 2005 to castle brands and um, floated it and then he sold to castle brands and um, but then his life goal was always to set up his own distillery so he kind of went around ireland looking where can he set up a distillery in ireland and um, originally he was born in dublin Tried to set up a distillery in Dublin. Near impossible to set up a distillery in Dublin. There's a couple here already, which is actually illegal to store uh, alcohol in Dublin. Um, back in the 1800s, we had a big massive fire where uh, a whiskey warehouse went on fire. So as you can imagine, high proof whiskey, fire, good friends. Um, so as I said- Is that the real reason why no one stores any alcohol in Ireland? That's totally why. <laughs> yeah. Well, we store it outside, like literally on, on the border. Um, but uh, yeah, so he actually got, he got dragged down to this place um, in the northwest of Ireland called Drum Shambo. Um, really, really small town. Population 810 people at the moment. Um, so as you can imagine, tiny. You sneeze, everybody knows. Um, so it's one of those really, really small communities. But what brought him down there was, there was about 65 years ago, there was um, this woman who worked in the mines, big massive mining community, worked in the mines. Cause Drumshambo, when you translate it back to Irish is the ridge of the old hut. It's where all the miners used to live. Um, so there was this woman who was a bookkeeper for the mines and this guy called Seamus came down to audit the mines. And they met and 64 years later they were still married um, and they actually pity actually shame was actually passed away there just before christmas but they're actually pj's parents so we had a really really close um connection to drum shambo you would have spent a lot of time as a kid kind of growing up there so as he came down there the minute he got down um, and he got to this old jam factory called Laird's Jam, and employed about 350 people in the local town. So you can imagine it was pretty much the only source of income. Everybody started working in Laird's Jam. Um, so Laird's actually closed its doors in 1992. Everybody lost their jobs. And if you actually go around the United States, the amount of people I find, and especially in Australia, from Drum Shambo that emigrated due to Laird's Jam Factory closing is huge. So he, uh, he got brought down there and there was 
the jam factory that got broken up into a unit called the food hub and they were funded by the government and each unit was part of a food and beverage so there's a cheese factory up there a chocolate factory and a jam factory there's a new cookie factory there's printing there's everything up there uh, and there was one unit left so pj got into the unit and this was a storage unit this is where everybody kept like literally it was like look you know that show uh, storage wars where everyone just dumps everything into a locker and just leaves there for many years until someone kind of picks out the locker exactly like that and um, so he ended up taking the last unit up in the uh, distillery or sorry up in the food hub and uh, decided this is where he's gonna set up his distillery so from day one he wanted to be a multi-purpose distillery he wanted everything from whiskey gin vodka and God only knows what else he's got to bring around. Um, so we have our full distillery set up there. We just literally built a visitor experience. And of course, we thought it was a good idea to open it during a pandemic, um, which didn't go too well. Uh, so we're, we're closed now again. Unfortunately, Ireland's in the strictest lockdown. I can't actually leave 1.2 miles radius of my house at the moment. Um, well, is that because of the pandemic or because of your um, your ankle your an ankle bracelet? <laughs> Bit of both, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so he um, so we set up the distillery. So we actually laid down the very first whiskey cask in the west part of Ireland in 101 years. So we are actually the first distillery in the west of Ireland. Um, since there was a old distillery on an island off the west coast called Nuns Island with a bunch of nuns making whiskey. <laughs> As you can imagine what that's going to be like. There's, there's a joke there. There's a couple of jokes <laughs> there, I think. I'm sure there's many jokes in the distillery. Um, so yeah, so he set up that, set up that multi-purpose distillery and then um, he started working. Ever since we started laying down the whiskey, we started working on gin. Uh, and a gin brand and what we're going to do. So PJ, he's like a postal stamp. He's been to all four corners of the world. He worked, he looked after Asia and um, Australia and everything for Bailey. So he actually spent a lot of time out there. And that's where he kind of got the main ingredient for Trumshamba Gunpowder Irish Gin, which is gunpowder tea, which is from the East Province of China and um, called Xingdang. And it's just literally tea pellets or tea leaves that are hand rolled into pellets and dried. So what they used to do was they used to export to uh, Simon out in Britain in these big massive barrels, opened up the barrels. And of course they had like Mandarin written on the bottle and um, which this actually is pearl tea, but of course nobody could read it. So they opened it up and saw these, all these pellets um, and they thought it looked like gunpowder pellets. So forever got its nickname as gunpowder tea. Um, in English. And then he picked up a lot of stuff on many journeys across the world. So everything from Mongolia to uh, all the way back to Germany to, and then the final botanical, which is probably one you haven't heard of, which is called Meadow Sweet. Um, really, really small honeysuckle flower grows around the distillery. So our head distiller, who's actually from Los Angeles, believe it or not, and um, lucky enough, Married an Irish girl, so he's going nowhere. Um, <laughs> so he can't, can't go back. He actually worked in, he worked in Napa and many wineries and breweries um, before getting to distillation. So yeah, Brian Taft's lucky, married a Sligo woman, so he's here to stay. Um, and then, so yeah, so him, Brian Taft and his young daughter literally spent two weeks, late July, early August, when Meadow Sweet is in bloom around Drum Shambo and spends those collecting as much as possible for the year's batch. Um, and then that's, that's kind of how we do it. So we use, we use German made stills um, from a company called Arnold Hoistein based out of the Baden region. All stills run with a steam jacket. We use 12 botanicals in total. Eight of them go into the copper pot still um, with their neutral grain spirit. And uh, we really, really slowly start adding that steam into the still bringing that vapor and that alcohol up to temperature. Uh, and as the alcohol vapor starts coming off, we use a big bulbous head. Um, you can, the minute you walk into our distillery, you can see the big bulbous head. And that's how you know our gin still, rather than our cone heads for our whiskey. 
um, higher reflux rate with a, with a bulbous head and more surface area. So you have that kind of reflux back into the still. And then we have a vapor still, which we only use fresh citrus, fresh grapefruit, fresh lime, lemons, fresh limes. And that's also where we put the gunpowder tea in. Um, comes off the still and because it has so much citrus in it. Um, we rested for about 14 to 28 days. Uh, the guys are constantly smelling, tasting all the uh, resting spirit. And they'll know when to make the cuts and bring it down to 43 ABV. And then also to give it a really, really light chill filter just to get rid of that citrus haze. So if you actually chill a bottle of gunpowder down, you actually see that citrus haze come back. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just fresh citrus. But uh, as if you uh, like a thing of Sambuca, if we left it unfiltered and you put a drop of water or some ice into it, it goes like cloudy and people see cloudy gin. Um, so we just brought it back down to a clear liquid. And then we, uh, then we uh, ship it uh, around the world. So yeah, we ship it to, I think we're 65 countries now um, and the gin is only five years old. So it's been a, it's been a huge success so far. A uh, question for you, what, um, what is the ABV in comparison to the new one that you were talking about? Is it the same? Exact same, yeah, both the 43. Okay. Um, so this is actually, we don't, it's not a complete different variation. It's actually, we're just swapping out the, the lemon citrus with Sardinian citrus. So it's just oh, okay. a hint. So it's oh, not so the, so the rest of the botanicals and the percentage of the botanicals, everything exactly is the same. Exactly the same. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so, so it, it really is, it really is like a, um, um, a variant of existing gunpowder yeah. and not like a completely different mark then. No, it's still, it's still drum shambo gunpowder ice gin at the core. But just a bit of Sardinian citrus, just, it's such a, if you ever look at the fruit, Google it, it's really, really great fruit and um, really, really fresh. Kind of like a, kind of like a, it's a mixture of like an orange and a, and a grapefruit. Um, but they grow in these big, big, massive kind of, uh, I think they're like balls, kind of citrus balls. Um, is it, is it like pomela where it's predominantly like the pith and the fruit in itself is small? Is it like that? And... Um, not really, and um, there is a good pit on it. Um, now I haven't, because of the pandemic and because we, we've made it in the distillery, I actually haven't got my hands on any of it because it's all up in the distillery. And uh, I'm anybody that's not in production is like, you're not allowed in. Um, so yeah, I the actually last, have the last thing somebody needs in production is to have one person, um, you know, one person, Ha, you know, be test positive, and all of a sudden you got to shut down production. So yeah, and that's the last thing we want. Um, so everything's on really, really strict control over there. Um, but I've seen photos of the fruit, and I've seen it being picked. Um, really, really full fruit, and I'll, I'll share some of some of the photos into the group later on of the fruit getting picked and stuff. Awesome, that'd be great. Um, since we were talking about the you know the variant that Connor mentioned with the Sardinian lemon. Um, Simon, can you talk about the new um, Ford's Gin Mark, the bubblegum gin that you're about to launch? <laughs> I'm really excited about it. No, Ping Gin is the new hot thing. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, bubblegum is a very historic style, comes from the 1980s. Um, very, very much inspired by the uh, comeback of Stranger Things and this type of vibe. We thought that bubblegum and we're going to be going for a Wrigley's Mint for our follow-up. Mm. Mm. That sounds great. <laughs> Can't wait. That's going to be great for South Sides. I'll be honest. I'll wait. Yeah, for that. Actually, good, good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At least you're not picking bits of mint out of your teeth. Yeah, it's exactly. It's already been filtered for you. It just got that, and you know, and now there's these modern flavors we've accepted, like vanilla mint. I feel like, I mean, Simon, I feel like you're up to, you're onto something. I like it <laughs> because I do get asked on a regular occasion. Are you going to make a pink gin? Oh, do you really? Okay. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I think haven't everyone gets that committed any violent acts towards anyone that's asked that question yet. Oh, that's sweet. I feel like you're really, you're really progressing in your anger management. That's great. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, for as you mentioned earlier, how, how, how the gin came about, um, you know, beyond just your experience in, um, in traveling, working with, you know, with other companies, but um, also just a, a personal passion for gin. And then of course the, how the conversation first uh, happened with Sasha and then how that all sort of came to fruition. But um, in terms of the actual construction of the gin itself and how you chose botanicals and how you chose flavor profile, how did you decide which direction you wanted to go? 
Sure. I mean, Ford's gin borrows a little bit of this and a little bit of that for everything I've ever loved and liked in gin in, in the past. You know, and it, it would be remiss not to sort of talk about how that sort of came about and, you know, and our philosophy, because, you know, there was something that, again, I think a lot of people might relate to on this call, but um, back back when we were sort of developing this gin, Sasha and I had this sort of common bonding over one small kind of tiny detail. And that was, it, we had this theory that if you ask someone what their favorite gin is. Someone who likes gin will tell you their favorite gin, but someone who loves gin will go, well, my favorite gin in a martini is this. My favorite in a gin and tonic with this tonic is this. My favorite in a Tom Collins is this. And that was me and that was Sasha and that was kind of where it started. And so that then took us to the world of being geeks. We're like, what is it about this gin that makes a great gin fizz? And what is it about this gin that makes a um, a great martini. So we started sort of doing evaluations and, um, and then we sent those evaluations to a lot of bartender friends to see which gins. So we said, what is your favorite gin and a martini? What's your favorite gin and a gin and tonic favorite gin and a fizz, for example. And we sort of saw commonalities in the gins that were chosen in fizzes. It was high juniper content, you know, martinis it usually was more balanced botanical set. Lots of sometimes, you know, Angelica, bright citrus, you sort of see these, these goals. So we sort of had this epiphany that let's just try and make a Jack of all trades cocktail gin and specifically influenced by Sasha owning milk and honey because he didn't have a back bar and he just wanted a drink that worked well with all of the different types of cocktails. And in particular, it was sort of about making a gin that did three things if you simplify it. One is having a silky viscous texture. So really looking at the amount of oil you pull from the botanicals so that when you make a martini, it's silky. Um, and it doesn't get too watered down. So we spent a lot of energy on actually the amount of botanicals we use to the ratio of alcohol to make sure, um, it, you know, if you add a splash of water to a neat drop of Ford's, it actually lifts the flavors rather than um, diminishes them. I mean, it releases the botanical flavor, which most gins will do, but it also, you know, you, I think you were talking a little bit about it too for a gunpowder gin, but it sort of adds the oil content and you start to see some oil in the glass. Um, but we also wanted a, a profile of botanicals that would go well with lemon and go well with lime. Uh, now, juniper, interesting enough, when we're looking at flavor guides, because this was the second part of the journey after getting this, we would get cocktail books and we'd get flavor guides, you know, the flavor Bible, the flavor manual, and we'd start looking at which botanicals paired with the flavors found in common cocktails. And then we started making theoretical gin recipes uh, and these theoretical gin recipes were sort of flavor maps that tied us to uh, mint for South Sides, you know, lime for Rickies and Gimlets, lemon for things like the Tom Collins and the Corpse Reviver. So we were sort of trying to assemble, theoretically, this is at this particular point, assemble a gin recipe and put it together that would work well in the classic cocktails that made gin famous, the ones that we've come to know and love. Out of now, curiosity, is, Simon, did you do like I, you early on? You, I remember you even had some of your sketches, and there was a there was a conversation that I had with Sasha at um, San Antonio Cocktail Classic years ago um, about about that sort of brainstorming. Did you do it in in like the circle line con connected? Yes. Like, is okay. Yeah, and it was fun because you sort of, you know, we did we did some where we worked from the botanicals outwards to the cocktails, and we did some where we worked from the cocktails backwards, and we would choose individual cocktails and look at the botanicals would match, and then we were starting to sort of form these these theories. The flaw in the plan, though, was, um, you know, Sasha was a struggling bartender, and I was a brand ambassador. We did not have a distillery. <laughs> that was um, that was sort of really. Uh, it's a bit like uh, being. I remember when I was 14 and I said, let's start a rock band. And me and my friends said, yes. And we had a name for the band. We've even decided the backdrop. Uh, but none of us actually owned a guitar or a drum set yet. You know, like it was uh, a bit like that. We didn't have a distillery. And so you had the hair for it, though. So that you I mean you were 50% <laughs> of the hair. Well, we ended up taking our recipe to five, six distillers that I'd met over the years just working in the gin industry and had them start th uh, making our recipes for us. And what was interesting about that process is there was one particular distiller that was making the best versions of every single one of our recipes, but not just that. 
I called him the master of no nonsense because he would actually put us in our place every time we had a ridiculous idea because he understood gin making. Uh, his name was Charles Maxwell. He owns a distillery in South London called Thames Distillers. And um, he himself has been making gin there since 1996, but his family had been making gin since 1680 uh, for 10 generations. Uh, George Bishop was his great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> and, and, um, and he joined the Worshipful Company of Distillers in London and started making gin as an apprentice. And every generation had made um, gin. In fact, in 1740, one of the oldest gin brands was created by his family. Um, sold in the early 90s. And it, it actually looked like for a minute he was going to be the one generation not to make gin. He made Stone's, Krabby, Krabby, uh, Stone's Ginger Wine for about three years and then went, you know what, I need to be making gin and, um, and started the distillery, which was long before this sort of gin boom that we've had. Um, so when I went to him it, 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 with this idea of a bartender's gin, and he started making the recipes. And every time he made a recipe, we'd bring it back to New York and we'd make martinis with it. We'd make gin and tonics. And then we would start tweaking it and go back to him. And so essentially, there was a process that took about almost three years, two years, nine months, 83 different versions of Fords. And then we said, this is the, this is the gin. I think there was a good omen as well, because not everyone, maybe everyone will know this guy, but Dale DeGraff, King Cocktail, wrote The Craft of the Cocktail. He came to the distillery with me the day that the recipe that's now in Ford's gin, and we did a tasting at the distillery of the gins. And he was, he's like, it was, it's that one. It's, it, you know, like that's the one. And, and I'm like, I'm not sure, Dale. I'm not sure, Dale. And to give him credit, that's the one that ended up in the bottle to this day. I made 15 gin recipes post that one. And then I went back to that one. And I, and I was like, Dale, damn it, Dale was right. I actually don't know if I've told Dale this, to be honest. But um, I, I feel like this, listen, the best part is this is going to get cleaned up and put on YouTube. So I can literally send him the video and be like, Dale, just skip to uh, 42 minutes and 17 seconds where Simon admits you that go. you owe him every <laughs> single dollar behind Ford Gen. <laughs> Yeah. It was a good. It was a good moment, though. You know, like when when you when you get the um the endorsement of Dale Dale DeGroff, it's great. In fact, when I I took that recipe when I finally had tweaked it, and it was really tweaking the oil content, and I took that recipe to um, Audrey Saunders, and she made Ford's gin in um, all of the classic cocktails that Sasha and I had sort of written down, and she uh, and she basically put the gin to a blind taste test against my other favorite gins of the time and just handed it to me. And I picked my own gin in 13 of 14 uh, cocktails that night. And, um, and that was the moment I had confidence to actually release a, release a gin. Will you admit what the 14th was? Yeah, it was, um, it was a drink called the white lady. Um, and the, the, the version I picked as my favorite was, a beef eater white lady. So uh, I'll give Desmond Payne a beef eater some kudos and some credit. Um, it, and, and I actually think the reason why is, uh, and we'll talk about the botanicals and forwards now, but beef eater is quite a bitter and robust gin. And so it's just a sugar drink, um, the white lady. So I feel like um, that, that um, you know, that bitterness of uh, beef eater really sort of carried through. Um, uh, one of, one of, someone in our audience, um, Betsy actually commented that you had 14 cocktails that night. Um, Betsy, I, if you weren't paying attention earlier, I thought we talked about the fact that you can have 17 martinis. 14 is actually low. And, so. and, and, and Betsy, on top of that, we had four of each version of those cocktails. <laughs> and, and, and what was interesting about what um, Audrey was doing was is so, in some drinks, she would mix two of my favorite gins together. Or in some drinks, she would have half Fords and half another gin and I would be tasting Fords against that. So she was being quite mean in the process uh, of, of, um, of making sure that I actually liked my, my own gin. But I actually had nothing but the utmost respect for that process because that was the moment I really did have confidence because it's very hard, I would say, to confidently release a gin in 2012, which was the year we released Fords. Um, with what with the gins that were already out there at the time, because there were some that there still are, they, but there were great gins already, and it was hard, you know, to really feel like confident that you were filling a gap. And that was the moment I went, "We are, you know, we're doing we're doing this," and so um, we're still in business eight years down the road. 
but um, just just the, the nine botanicals and the production really quickly that Charles sort of makes for us down at Thames Distillers. But we we actually have half of our recipes juniper. Uh, juniper was so important um, for me to have a juniper forward um, gin. And at the time, if you think 2012, apart from the classics, people were shying away from juniper. So we sort of went back. So 50% uh, juniper. We have a lot of coriander, which is very big part of London dry gin style. Three citruses, uh, bitter orange, lemon, uh, grapefruit also. Uh, two florals, orris root, quite a common gin botanical from the, flat, uh, the bulb of the iris, and jasmine flowers. And then we have two spices, which is cassia and angelica, which both give a perception of sweetness, but are actually quite drying because they're sort of roots. Um, and that perception of sweetness kind of brings um, some of the palate to the front of the tongue, so you get a sort of nice balance for drinks like a martini. They're made in two little stills called Tom Thumb and Thumbelina. They're 500 liters each in size. Um, they, they're made by John Dory, and John Dory um, is a now defunct gin still, still making company that was a descendant of Aeneas Coffee, the Irish stillmaker. Um, and so they became John Dory, and they would sell gin stills in, in London until they uh, stopped making them, I guess, about 20 years ago now. And um, Nothing's added after distillation, which is what makes us a true London dry gin. So real botanicals go in the still, which is something that all of the gins that you're trying today have in common, all of the gins that are being talked about today have in common. So we, um, we, we all use real botanicals. And then after uh, distillation, we just add water to, um, to cut it down to proof. So no sort of uh, essences or uh, other flavors or sugars added, which is in line and in tune with what makes the London dry gin style. So that's Ford's gin. And I'm on martini number two, so I still got one to go before. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, again, depending on the math, you may actually have between 12 and 15 to go. So that's fine. Um, thank you, Simon. Really appreciate it. Normally, I mean, for those of you who are, have participated in our happy hours before, you know, for the most part, we, we really cut it up into a bunch of different sections. But this was one of those categories where... Um, you know, unlike Japanese whiskey, where I felt like there's a lot of people that didn't really know much about it. And that would have been a, a pretty much like a, a data download, just a data dump of information. This is a category that people feel like they do know a lot about. And then you suddenly realize as you do these deep dives in, actually not even deep dives, pretty shallow dives into gin, you realize, wow, they're each one has so many different layers, both in the botanicals and the construction and the flavor profile. Um, and then of course, to what we're going to do just after the next segment, which is figure out which cocktails it goes best with. And, and Simon actually already, um, you know, made reference to that earlier when they were doing their first experimentation. The one thing that we that we do actually do um, every single one of our happy hours is we talk about the status of the hospitality industry. Um, and sometimes, depending on who our guests are, sometimes we'll have like a brand ambassador or um, a supplier or a bartender. We get to talk about like the different. Um, levels of, of the hospitality business. What I really want to touch upon right now, especially Simon, since you just came back from visiting family, is what is it like for the hospitality industry in the UK? And Connor, if I can um, have you start first, what's it like right now for the hospitality industry in Ireland? Uh, so and, and more importantly, what, what is it can, that we can do for folks who are struggling right now? Yeah, so the hospitality industry in Ireland, and um, we haven't had a pub open since last March. Um, completely shut down. It's been and the country has not been burned to the ground yet, is what you're saying. No, um, I don't even. Lucky enough, they kept the liquor stores open, so we can still get booze. We didn't go down the South Africa route. I don't know how they did it. I say they were making prison hooch by closing all, even the liquor stores. But yeah, no, the hospitality industry here, it's it's been tough. Um, I have a lot of a lot of friends, especially that have worked were bartenders, bar owners. One of my closest friends just uh, at birth, my birthday party, what a year and a half ago, we were sitting out in my back garden, gorgeous day, um, and we were like, "Do you know what Ireland doesn't have? Tiki bar." What happens three months later? He opens up a tiki bar. So uh, he has he hasn't had his bar open since last March. Um, so, and it looks like even, even Temple Bar, which everyone knows about really is kind of the go-to place when you get to Ireland, um, is, 
hasn't been open and they're saying they won't be open until September. So it's been, it's been really, really tough. Um, l- lucky enough, the government here in Ireland have actually had a really, really good scheme um, with having a, a payment um, a funding for all people in the hospitality industry um, to keep them somewhat afloat. But the bars haven't earned anything. Like even, I'm pretty sure you probably got to see quite a few bars not even open um, once we get out of this. So, and you can imagine what Guinness are like with their kegs. They, uh, Guinness had to take back all their kegs back last March. And then we opened, we opened up the, the, we call them dry pubs. Wet and dry pubs was the name the government decided to give things. Um, I've never seen a pub be dry, but that's what they gave them. It was pretty much a pub that just served food. Um, and once they serve foods, they're allowed to serve alcohol. Um, so that's kind of the situation here in Ireland um, in relation. And what, are, what are people doing for, you know, for example, and so, so one thing to clarify really quickly, Connor used the term scheme. Um, and so, you know, like in that, uh, in, in Ireland and in the UK, when you say scheme, he's talking about a program. It's not, <laughs> it's not something nefarious. Um, no, no yeah. so I, uh, so, so getting, like when you say when you say like the government has a scheme, all of a sudden everyone here is like, you know. So yes, um, no, no, are, it's it's a, it's a good, it's a stimulus package. So every week they get three hundred and fifty euro, which is about roughly or nearly four hundred dollars um, payment. And then what what are people doing for their pivots? Like what are people uh, doing in order to stay afloat? It's per- in particular, uh, bartenders uh, drinking a lot of drinking. Okay. okay. <laughs> Everyone, but, everybody's um, got a plan. No, so there's, like a, there's a lot of, it's actually created a lot of kind of really, really good like innovation, bartenders rethinking. And um, I've seen, so every, like the news every week, Irish news is really boring compared to American news. Um, we have a, like a weekly What's report. What's that like? Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's interesting. It's a, uh, I think like the most excitement was some some woman down in the middle of the country won the lotto. Um, that was probably the highlight of today's news. Um, but every week they kind of have this report of, it was like prohibition times, what she been, what kind of a saloon was famed. And people are getting really crafty with their saloons. Like they're getting pool tables put in, they're getting dart boards. Um, it's like, I... Just Google Irish she bean at the moment. It's some of these people are really thinking outside the box, these bartenders. And, and also they've built like they've turned ice cream, ice cream trucks into um, beer delivery systems. So they're having taps so you can actually get pints of Guinness delivered to your house. Uh, and they have a minimum order of four pints of Guinness you can buy to order. So, of course, you got to order eight. It's, um, it's pretty easy to find a couple of friends. You don't even need a couple of friends. Just park the van <laughs> in the driveway, and we're, we're fine. And um, and then like these, though, there's like a new companies we've seen up, like Garden Bar Ireland, where this company comes in and builds you a full bar in your back garden. Um, so a lot of the the industry, it's kind of gone either way. Some people have just kind of decided to stay at home, just got to wait it out, and enjoy their their package from the government Um, and then other people are taking this opportunity to really think outside the box and come up with these clever ideas and like we have we've had a a new distillery open up in ireland that are doing like launching a brand new distillery during a pandemic is pretty tough because you can't do really any market activations or getting it out there so they're starting to do really kind of weird distillations and like cream soda uh, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so everyone's kind of now kind of having to, you have to reinvent yourself really during this whole thing. And it gives you an opportunity to, you have so much spare time. You can either sit in the couch and just whatever, watch TV, play Xbox for the day, or else you can come up with a really, really cool um, uh, idea and drop a Guinness keg into the back of your car and start delivering to people. Um, or coming up a new, like, there's quite a, like a 
pre batch cocktails have become a huge thing. Um, and a lot of bartenders are doing virtual cocktail trainings, virtual cocktail uh, hours. Um, we also got in, um, we have, so we have the WSET wine and spirits exam, but they actually now split it up. So they're actually doing, so a, they've set up a, a spirits um, WSET now that they're giving out to bartenders. So bartenders get a, a supplement to be able to do training and get their WSET in spirits level two or three. So they can- It's, it's, it's something that quite frankly, people who are working that job very rarely have time to do that now yeah. they're, as you said, there's some people that are gonna be productive and some people that are not, and some people that can't because they have figured out some other way to work and make a living. And so, you know, the hustle is real. It's happening, you know, even more now for a lot of folks than, than before. Yeah. I, it's, it's pretty much the same thing that happened during prohibition. You, you stop the bars, you find out a different way to supply alcohol. Yeah, or all of a sudden you get daiquiris and mojitos and all kinds of fun stuff just because you're you're importing ID, you're you're exporting bartenders who then import new ideas from yeah, other places. Like even one one of my favorite prohibition cocktails, like the bees knees. Simple. We have fantastic honey here in Ireland. And created during prohibition just to kind of better the flavor of gin. I mean, if only you had gin that you could use with that Irish honey, I feel like you'd be set. Ah, uh, if only we had an Irish gin I and know. some Irish bitters. You can get on that. We'd really appreciate it. <laughs> I'll try. I'll get working on it today. Thank you. Um, Simon, <laughs> with, with your visit to the UK, did you spend any time in London or was it all in Dan's fridge? <laughs> I, I, it's funny, I went to the town of Bath, which is where I grew up, but, uh, and I, I, I tend to go there every couple of years because my family lived there and I haven't been able to get a home uh, for obviously since the pandemic. Um, and then there was this thing called test to release where you go into self-isolation. Uh, you take a test before you get on the plane, a test as you land, and then a test five days later uh, while in self-isolation, and then they let, they let you out. And Bath would, and, but... I, I'm living in Nashville at the moment. So Bath was, Nashville's been like a Petri dish for what's going on, right? And so, and, and, and I'm surrounded by a few high risk people. So we've been nowhere. And the way we've been supporting the industry is by lots of takeouts, right? Takeouts, takeouts, and buying all of our Christmas presents as um, gift cards from these venues just to keep supporting them. But we couldn't really go out. Now, what was interesting about doing tests for release is we all like, here we, we are in Bath with no COVID. Uh, we've just been approved. And we look at the cases in Bath when we arrive, and it was on what was called a tier two, and there had been one case on December 11th. And right now, I think we were sort of, you know, we're talking like December, December like 22nd right now. And there'd only been one case in that entire period. So we went to a restaurant for the first time <laughs> in that period is the most random thing. I mean, the, the, it's, you know, like, I, it reminded me of being like 16, 17. You don't know how to socialize with anybody or how to interact <laughs> when you go out for the first time. You know, Simon, or, can you describe that to me in detail? <laughs> what it's like it, it was so weird. You know, you know, like when you awkwardly approach someone you fancy for the very first time, that was like how it was meeting anybody and everybody. Like, like the waiter stood next to me and I'm like, what are you doing there? Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it, was a, it was a completely random experience. It's because um, England at the time had done a tier system, tier two, tier three, tier four. So if you're in tier four, you're full on lockdown, you can't go out, everything's shut. Tier three, um, you know, social distancing, this, you know, and then we were in this tier two environment. Of course, only a few days later, the government announced that everyone was going into tier four because the people in tier three and tier four were going into tier two places. So it didn't last long, but it was a very, uh, for a minute, it, it showed that if, if people kind of complied a little bit to what is being asked of them, it can actually, um, it, the system can work. And because people weren't, of course, the English government slapped, slapped everyone's wrists and, 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 and sent them home. But for a minute, for a minute, I, 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 I saw the, 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 the light but um, what I will say is the bottle cocktail game of, uh, of England is amazing. Like the Hawksmoor sent me all of their cocktails. And that for me was the most beautiful thing because 
I was, I, I'm an okay bartender, right? You've seen, I just like eyeballed my 50, 50 martini and stirred it with bad ice from my freezer. Right. Let's not take tips from Simon Ford here. Just like, I, I, I like my gin, but, um, but these drinks, the bottled martinis, the bottled um, uh, citrus drinks and tequila drinks, they were just phenomenal. And so like everyone is honed in their bottled cocktail and canned cocktail game in this in this situation so i felt like when i was drinking at home i was drinking bars from my favorite bartenders and that felt good there's 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 a, a company out right now that's actually doing specific cocktails from sp specific bars around the world so that you can um, essentially feel like you're there there's also i've got something here to show everybody Let me do this real quick do a little share this is from can everybody see this this is from um, Rye, which is a bar in San Francisco. And they basically did a couple of classic cocktails and did like, you know, play on words. I think like the El Presidente is one of my favorite cocktails of all time. And so they did one called El Presidente. And it was, it was one of those things that like, regardless of how you feel politically, this is great. They did like a little box, um, a little box to, to ship to people or have them pick up for inauguration and had each one of them was, easily enough for two people um, full-size cocktail and the box came with two so you could get like the pina kamala or the chartreuse vep which i thought that, sorry veep which i thought was very funny because there is a chartreuse vep which is an extra age um they they it got pretty cheeky but there there are all kinds of cool things like this that we can do to like support our local bar and it's good to know that that's still that's happening all around the world and anything that y'all can do um, for your your local bar um, do that like there's there's always going to be that random thing that you can only get on Amazon but if you're able to support your local bar even people that are going out and buying like a lot of the shaker and spoon kits I see a lot of folks actually buying the liquor from their bar from their local bar that have bottle shop licenses right now anything you can do to do that is great so um, thank you guys for, for sharing those stories. I appreciate it. I think that what Shaker and Spoon is doing by engaging the bartenders is brilliant, Donnie. That's, that's part of this too. Thank you. Um, and, you know, Connor was mentioning that there's you know, a lot of people doing virtual, um, you know, cocktail events. You know, if we, if we ever get like, you know, a corporate order or someone calling and saying, hey, we want to get, you know, 200 kits and do, a bunch of different virtual happy hours. We'll say, oh, where are you located? Oh, our company's in St. Louis. Oh, hey, we have uh, a, a Shaker and Spoon alum bartender named Natasha who actually owns a gin bar and she's phenomenal and she would be a great person to run that virtual tour. So um, if any of you have, um, you know, companies that want to do something like that, you can always shoot Shaker and Spoon customer service a message and we'll always tie in a pretty incredible bartender who right now doesn't have another source of income. So, you know, definitely let us know. Um, we're not, this is going to be like our, we're a little bit uh, stretch on time right now, but one of the things folks have been waiting for is we're going to do gin cocktails on the fly. So um, I have a, a couple of, oh, sorry, Amy, I will, uh, I'll post the link to the inauguration kit. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit you with a couple of different questions that people have asked so far and then now everybody has the opportunity based on like either it doesn't have to be shaker and spoon syrups or anything but if you have like a weird ingredient at home and you want to post it into the chat um we will sort of you know quiz our 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 two gentlemen here about what they would create uh what gin cocktail they would create using those recipes and while we're waiting for people to post stuff we had two questions um Number one is, what is, how would you define dry gin? Simon, if you want to take that one. Yeah, it, that, it's, um, it's a historical term, dry gin. Um, so when you look at the gin craze in London, which is often uh, fueled by a raw spirit that's made of molasses, um, uh, you know, and then very much uh, distillation is not good. Single pot distillation, if you're lucky, um, for, for gin. So the old Tom style, which um, you would add sugar 
um, emerges. And if you look at even the, the oldest gin brand in the world is Boards, which is an old Tom gin. It's got sugar added. Um, if you look at the early Tanqueray, uh, that had sugar in it. In fact, Tanqueray launched a gin called Tanqueray and Sweetened. Now, what happened around the um, 20s, 30s is the invention of continuous distillation. And all of a sudden, because the quality of alcohol improved so much in London, there was a trend towards um, not needing to add sugar, which was expensive at the time, incidentally, um, to mask the flavor of bad alcohol or any, anything else. So you saw this trend uh, move towards dry gins or, or unsweetened gins, as they were termed. Now, there was a guy called William Banting that put out a book called uh, A Letter on Copulence, uh, which sold 50,000 copies off the back in the 1860s. And he put out a diet called the Banting Diet, William Banting, Banting Diet. It's, it's quite funny, but he cut out all sweet alcohols. Um, uh, he cut out Madeira, which was sweet, sherry, which was sweet, champagne, mostly sweet at the time, um, port, lots of the things that the English would, would drink. And he and did it in favor of this newfangled dry gin that had hit the market or this unsweetened gin. Now, he lived until he was 82. He lost uh, something like 46 pounds off of this diet, the Banting diet. So this beats the South Beach diet any day. And the trend for dry gin emerges in London. And so brands then started to uh, label their gin dry gin, which was essentially just to say we're not adding any sugar. Uh, and that caught on. Uh, the London Dry in itself meant you weren't allowed to do it. So that when you added London to the dry gin part of it, uh, by law, you weren't allowed to add the sugar. So it was a, a, a change in the trend of gin making over that period. Um, by the way, for those of you who are in the um, Let's Drink to That private Facebook group, do a search for Tim Cooper. Um, Tim actually did a really incredible post um, all about that particular thing. Um, you know, someone asked about gin categories and he wrote a really incredibly well done, comprehensive um, post. So you go into the group, hit the magnifying glass, just the search and just look up Tim Cooper. You'll see that he's in general has been pretty active um, in the group, but has been very helpful. He's a, you know, t bartender with 20 years experience um, and um, although he works with Fords, really uh, is talking about the category as a whole, as a whole. And it was, oh yeah, yeah, Betsy saw that as well. He did a great job of doing a very simple breakdown. So Simon, keep that in mind next time you're thinking about firing him. Just like give him like a couple extra days, something. He just he really did a good job. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, okay, Marge asked about the bulbous still. Connor, thank you for posting that photo. If you guys look in the chat. There is a link to the bulbous still that Connor was talking about earlier, which is great. Um, and then if anybody has some weird uh, ingredients, again, whether they're shaker and spoon syrups or something that you have at home and you're looking to uh, come up with a great gin cocktail, um, you know, try these knuckleheads out and see what they can come up with because that's what they're, they're here to help you with. I had one question earlier that was about berries. And I feel like that's a fairly um, easy one to speak to. Connor, if you want to dive into like various berries. Yeah, what was the question? Um, if, if someone ha had a, you know, a collection of fresh berries and like various different kinds of berries, what would be like some of the best gin recipes for them oh. to uh, use that? Like my, my go-to, especially because outside my garden, we get ram uh, blackberries growing every summer. They just grow wild. You pick them. They're fantastic and um, a really, really simple drink, a bramble. Um, I love it. Really fresh and perfect. And um, also raspberries, great clover club and um, kind of cocktail. I think fresh fruit in cocktails are, you can't beat it. And especially when you have these markets, there's so many of these kind of cool markets opening up where people are, have their own, uh, little patches and they grow their own different styles of berries and um, another really kind of famous style gin around these kind of areas is slow gin and um, using slow berries especially around the christmas they grow hedge grows grow everything 
literally throw them into a bottle of gin, leave the bottle of gin in a, in a dark press and just let it uh, create that slow, gorgeous gin. Really, really what great you, kind of Christmas drink. What's your favorite build for a ramble? Uh, one of the things we talked about multiple times on the group before is, um, you know, you can look up a cocktail recipe and find five different recipes um, and they're all different, especially, especially between, um, you know, different parts of the world like if you're looking at uk recipes versus things you're finding in the middle east versus the united states when you make a bramble what is your favorite build in particular with gunpowder uh, so i usually bramble straight glass tall collins glass about this size and just throw about a handful of blackberries into it and um, throw a tiny bit of I always try and, try and do the conversions of ounces and mils in my head is always a, a slow process. Um, so about 15 mils, about quarter ounce of, um, or half ounce, half okay. ounce, half okay. ounce of um, simple syrup. And uh, two, I usually gonna go heavy on gin. I, I think the best cocktail for gin is gin with a splash of gin. It's usually the best way to drink it. Um, don't need to, don't need any of that ice or something. Just neat gin but um so i usually put in about two ounces of gin on top of it and just just muddle slightly break open those brown uh those blackberries uh with a bit of uh i use probably around a good 30 mils one ounce of uh lemon juice as well and then literally top up crushed ice and then a bit of soda water and then a couple of blackberries just on top and a, and a nice good good straw because and I always like I always find nearly the best part of uh, a bramble is just getting a spoon at the bottom and getting out all that good uh, blackberries and soaking in gin for uh, the last two minutes. How long you spent to drink your uh, your bramble? For for those of you who are big um, mint julep fans, um, the bramble is always one that that I, I try to help people equate with. Uh, the mint julep because the mint julep in and of itself is basically an old fashioned with mint syrup. You know, you're taking the mint, you're taking syrup, you're doing like that light press just to get the mint out. It's predominantly like a whiskey drink. And then you're topping it with like the crushed ice and the garnish. And with the, with the bramble, you're looking at like the juice from the berries plus the other ingredients. And then you're the, the best way to serve it. And then the cleanest way to serve it is like, like what Connor's talking about where you, have that stack of crushed ice in there, the straw on the top, the beautiful garnish, and then you enjoy what is essentially a big old boozy drink, right? So um, you can always shake it up and strain. The color is going to come through no matter what, and then pour it over fresh ice. But doing that like Collins where you actually get that really cool layer at the bottom and then your, um, your, especially if you have crushed or pebble ice, uh, Especially it, it, doctors it, it, are always telling you to get one of your five a day of fruit. So you might as well leave the fruit in there. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's so how I feel about you... olives in my martini. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, I, actually, I actually had a funny story about a, a friend of mine came over from San Francisco. We're at a wedding here in the, uh, in the West of Ireland and um, for my cousin's wedding. And anywhere you go in America, you can get a martini. You can order it. Everyone will give you no, God a bless you, Martini. <laughs> <laughs> you come to the west of Ireland. He ordered a martini, and I just looked at him and go, "You don't want to order a martini here." And he goes, "Why?" I was like, "Trust me." Out comes the martini in one a dirty glass and two. All they had was some black olives that probably were sitting there on a pizza earlier on. Um, and he looked at the martini and just kind of went, "You could have warned me." And I was like, "I warned you." <laughs> Yeah, there's only I so many times I, I can say I told you so. I have this theory about martinis because, you know, when, when I first came to America, the, like the martinis were seven ounces and the olives were like, the you know, like they, they, they looked like they came from Chernobyl. They were like so big. <laughs> and, and, and that was, there, there was something about it. And of course, what that led to was this trend in these little coops and these chilled, and they made like the most perfect martini, you know, and you could have more martinis because it was smaller and your martini was always cold. And this is the correct way, right? The small glass. But boy, do I miss those seven ounce giant like steakhouse martinis. There's something about them that's just like, like it's like magical. It's a bit like, you know, you know, you, you, you want to go in a time machine back to when you could get a seven ounce martini. With I, there's actually one bar in Illinois on the bottom of the, uh, <laughs> the Drake Hotel. 
in Chicago that <laughs> apparently has the largest martini in, uh, in the US. I think it's about 10, 12 ounces. Brilliant. I'm, I'm telling you, which is essentially similar to your bramble recipe you mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some, some things and then pour a bunch of gin in and see what happens. Um, there's like we were talking about before, like that one of the things that I really like about that pebble ice or crushed ice is doing that carafe where you get to keep it on the side. It doesn't matter if the carafe itself is, you know, can easily fit. You know, you make your drink that's a, a five ounce pour or four and a half ounce pour for like a Nick and Nora or these little five and a half ounce coupes, including the dilution. Have it, you know, the carafe can be another four and a half, five and a half ounces easily, which means you're really having a double drink but you're actually keeping cold and enjoying it. And because you're enjoying it in like the small sort of fancy coupe, you don't feel like you're as much of a derelict, but you still are, which is nice. It's like, I always keep one of my martini glasses around. <laughs> That's nice, yeah. There's a good Spanish gin and tonic right there. That's great. Yeah, um, yeah the, the standard is actually um, for the most part uh, those big glasses, Simon, were like almost 10 and a half, 11 ounces because they were trying to keep up with the double old fashioned and people were complaining that the martini glass didn't have enough liquid in it. Um, and and if you, you know, you go to Spain or anyone where they do like the gin tonic, uh, where the, am the ampersand is gone, um, they're still only doing, you know, one and a half ounce pours. But there's so much like love and care that goes into it. all the extra little things with tweezers that they're putting in and ginger and lemon peel and you get the grapefruit peel and so and they're massive. Yeah, the big balloon glasses, they're amazing. Um, okay, uh, any other cocktail questions for these guys? Oh, one one question I have for you guys: um, the Clover Club. Since we're already on the topic of berries, Clover Club is one of my favorites. And it's very rare that I find someone who, who knows how to make a good Clover Club. I think either they are, you know, throwing the berries in as though the berries are sweet, forgetting that if you're, even if you have great raspberries, they're extremely tart and it still needs a, a smidge of sugar in there. Um, Especially or, if you're bashing it off the walls of a cocktail shake, you just break out that bitterness. Right. Um, I mean, and, a bit of simple syrup in it just brings it out. That's it. That's so, it. It's a good Go recipe ahead, for puree as well, though, the, the, uh, you know, the, um, the Clover Club, just because of the egg white, right? Um, well, that, one of the things is, like, people look at recipes like that, and they think of it as, if they look at it like a daisy, where they have a little bit of sweetener, a little bit of modifier, and you're like, well, instead of the liqueur, like, my modifier really is the raspberry, right? Except, again, the raspberry is bringing an extra tartness to it and you're throwing quite a bit in that plus the lemon people forget that the egg white is also adding like a dry chalkiness to it and you really need to make sure that it has enough sugar to balance it all everyone like you know the, the taste is subjective everyone's going to have like a different level of where they want their sweetness but at the very minimum guys like just taste it you know add a little bit of extra one-to-one -one, um sweetener in there and see what you like but Clover Club still remains like a really well-made and well-strained Clover Club is a beautiful drink that although looks like, you know, a lady drink because it's pink and in this beautiful glass was actually created in, you know, for a gentleman's club. Uh, and I don't mean a strip club. This is like a, <laughs> like a gentleman's club, you know, like a, a men's club, if you will. Um, it's a definitely like a, um, a unisex, delicious, and when well-made and well-balanced, amazing drink. Um, I, 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 I do want to throw out one drink, though, uh, that I think is the unsung hero of gin drinks. And I think it would work well with every gin that you're, you know, the, the, here today. And that's the South Side. The gin mojito, ultimately, but just shaking, shaking the gin with the mint and the, the you know, a little bit of sugar and citrus. I mean, phenomenal. I, and, and then just... You could turn it into a spritz with some champagne if you want. I think that that is, but the gin always is the star of that drink. You know, everything else is accompanying the gin in that journey. And that's why I think that when you have a good gin, Southside is a great, great, refreshing drink. You know, after your third martini, when you feel like <laughs> lowering the ABV. 
<laughs> so you know what Simon's having tonight? <laughs> yeah, there's always up for a south side. It's a great. It's what I. It's it's really what I call a um, a great uh, gin gateway cocktail because it's so refreshing. And people who are like, I don't like gin. I, I mean, granted, you can't hit them with like a forty eight percent ABV gin in a south side and expect it to be like that. But you have something that's you know between forty and forty five that is um, a, like just on its own a beautiful well balanced gin that in a in a well made south side you're going to convert people to gin who have never liked gin before yeah. there's something really refreshing about it somebody asked uh amy stevens asked tell us ideas for a fancy european style gin tonic with herbs and citrus that isn't terribly high in sugar very simple Ooh. really um like the whole kind of Mediterranean style kind of gin and tonic, it's, it's really, really simple. They just use those big, massive balloon glasses and big wide opening on it. So good, good, decent size pour of, of gin. Um, and then they're using like, like the, like a good, good premium tonic, like a fever tree. Um, I really like the fever tree Mediterranean tonic because I think the quinine and stuff in tonic can sometimes can, depends on what tonic you use, can just overpower the gin. Um, I like, I also like gin with quite often with a, like soda water, just so you have the effervescence, just to shoot that juniper and that fresh uh, flavors from the gin right up into your nose. Um, and then literally with your garnish and stuff like that, like using really fresh kind of citrus, like, like we use fresh red grapefruit um, just to bring out, showcase the citrus that we use in the gin. But you can use rosemary in it. You can use different kind of herbs in it. Um, a lot of kind of citrus but then also like summertime you, they're nearly like a fruit salad bowl at the time so you're having everything from strawberries to raspberries to whatever your mother's christmas tree thrown into it they literally just put all the fruit into it so it does fill up the glass and a ton of ice and you're, as well. you're like wait a second who made my sangria clear i'm super confused yeah. it really you know, looks can like I get that. a spoon for this the straw yeah. isn't got to cut it and uh, one of the things that Simon, to answer that, to answer that question, Simon, one of the things you mentioned earlier is um, using, as a botanical, of course, is what you're talking about, using something that gives you, um, the, uh, what the term you use, like the idea of sweetness, the the Percep like, the perception, exactly. Thank you, like like cassia, or um, or or honestly, if there's a lot of people who who sort of um, have very strong feelings about ginger. But if you do have fresh ginger, ginger, cassia, um, I, I grew up really not liking licorice, but if you have um, like the star anise, that's incredible to, to, to bring a lot of flavor. Um, and I'm you can with, use light I'm tonics too. Star anise um, is one of my favorite things to put in a gin and tonic. Their flavor just starts to really infuse. I, I it would be remiss not to mention what the the Japanese are doing as well. It sort of builds on what you were saying a minute ago, Connor, about like just doing soda water because it lets the gin sing a little bit more sometimes than the tonic. But the Japanese are doing the gin and sonic right now as a highball, which is a combination of, uh, of uh, tonic water and soda water, so that this the tonic sort of toned down slightly in the mix and lets the the gin do more talking, which in turn lowers uh, the sugar content as well. And we all know that the Japanese like work on perfect perfection. So I would say that's a good thing. And even though it's not a gin and tonic, it sort of builds off of what you were saying, Connor, on the add soda. But the, the, the Ricky, which was invented in the 1880s in Shoemaker's Bar in Washington, D.C. So it's got a classic, so cocktail geeks can get all into it. But it's literally just gin, soda, and fresh lime juice. Yeah, and no sugar. That's like the original low ABV, low sugar cocktail. It's delicious. It's very easy for for those of you who are looking. So the the sonic or like the split between tonic and soda is always an easy one. I would always recommend you try and find something that is extremely effervescent. It's one of like, you know, much like we've we've had this conversation a lot before about three seven fives on vermouth. So you can have multiple ones in your in your fridge. Um, you, it can look like Simon's house, but you don't know. You never know what you're going to be in the mood for. They're all different, and that way you can hold on to them for uh, you know a couple of months and they still stay fresh. It's the same thing with the tonics. If you can find a local company, meaning they're not bottles that are being shipped all over the world, a local company that does little seven ounces, that's an easy thing for you know one or two drinks, especially if you're splitting between tonic and soda. Um, 
Fever Tree and Q and some of the domestic ones I've seen have a light version, uh, not to be confused with diatonic, which is very different and has fake sugar, just has less sugar in it, but still has all of like the quinine and the cassia and the, the other like barky things that you want in there. Um, but look around for light tonics to see what you can find. The, there's a ton of sugar in tonic and people forget about that. So the split base with the soda or the light tonics when they don't have fake stuff are all really incredible. Easy way to enjoy that drink. Um, we have just like another couple minutes. We're gonna do um, some trivia. And so we're gonna do um, some four pillars trivia. We're gonna do some Ford's trivia and we're gonna do some gunpowder trivia just to see for those who've been paying attention. Um, and in, in order to win, what you have to do is you have to put the first person to post the correct answer in the chat. So get your, you know, get your typing fingers ready and it'll be whichever one shows up in our chat first. And the winner for each of the respective um, recommended gins is going to uh, win that gin and also a tidy martini kit from Shaker and Spoon, which will be a real fun way for you to also test your, you know, what kind of vermouth you like and the percentage of the vermouth. So, oh wait, hold on, one more. Oh, sorry. Is there a tropical style drink made with gin? Um, yes, I have a great one in mind, but gentlemen, I'd rather you answer first. The, uh, because you don't want to say suffering bastard in front of everybody, which is the the. It tea. sounds better when you say it anyway. <laughs> but it, that's the tiki. That's the the tiki gin drink. I think it was invented in Egypt at the Shepherd's Hotel. If I'm correct, I might be getting my geographies wrong. But gin and tiki is uh, something worth putting into Google. There is uh, several drinks that will pop up for you, and uh, your umbrellas will uh, work. Connor, have any? Yeah, uh, I love tiki. It's, I think it's one of my favorite styles of cocktails. It's just, there's nothing beats you like just sticking on a tiki shirt and just having a bit of fun. It's kind of an excuse to get up to mischief really and to mess behind a bar. And it's always, it's all about good vibes. And but what was not, your, what was the bar that your friend opened? I forgot to ask you that. It's called Ohana. A um, what? Oh, oh, Ohana. 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 Okay. So friends in Hawaiian and, um, so yeah, it's anyone ever gets over to Dublin, check it out. Really, really cool bar. Um, but one of the cocktails I put on the menu was a Saturn, um, oh, gin yeah. style cocktail. So gin, lemon juice, yeah. passion fruit syrup, and a bit of orgat, and to bring out that really, really nice almond flavor, and a really fantastic. Give it a good shake over ice, and then into a into a low ball gas usually, or else if you have something cool and tiki like a mug, which I used to love collecting tiki mugs, um, always stick it in. Okay, my my uh, that's an that's an awesome drink, and um, and I think just in the last couple of months alone, the shaker and spoon um, family has been has become very familiar with. We we've, we've done uh, passion fruit syrup. We've done. Um, the passion fruit liqueur, the Chinola from the, from the Dominican Republic people, we've had all kinds of orgeat. So that that's a, it's, it's a, then that's a great drink. My, my one was the Winchester, which honestly is, I think one of my favorite sort of modern day, um, uh, tropical cocktail favorites. That's Brian Miller. Um, and he came up with it when Angus obviously was still a uh, global brand ambassador for Tanqueray. And it's actually a gin zombie. It's three different kinds of gin, including a navel, um, a navel strength, um, a London dry, and a um, an old Tom gin. So just like you know, with a zombie, three different rums, um, and then also uh, Saint Germain, which basically ensured the fact that it would never be made at Smuggler's Cove because they will never open a bottle of Saint Germain in Smuggler's Cove. But it is an awesome drink if you look up. The Winchester by Brian Miller, who any of you who have been on this happy hour before have met Brian. It is one of like my favorite um, inventive gin drinks and we've imitated it in a lot of different styles. Like we did a three layer mezcal drink one time that was an ode to that. Definitely um, check that out. And, and of course, to... the Singapore sling. And the sling. Yeah. The sling is, is, is like the, pretty much the go to. But there's a ton of terrible Singapore slings out there. So, yeah, just beware. 
Okay, um, Connor, I'm going to have you um, ask. Let's see. I, I think you can ask um, a two-part question. So, of your of your three questions that I have, you can ask two of them, and and someone and people have to answer both of them correctly in order to in order to win. So, I'm going to have Wait, you. Go. Is there any questions you want to ask me? One or want me to ask one, two, or three? Uh, or can no, I, you can, I think you can ask any of them. Yes. Cool. Perfect. Um, so the first question is, where is the botanical we use meadow sweet from? And then what's the second question? They've got to answer both. And then the second one is, what is the animal on the bottle that we use? What is the name of the animal? And uh, for the meadow sweet, it has to be from what's the uh, town it's from. Yeah, I think I think folks are folks are, are confusing the meadow sweet and the gunpowder tea. So those of you who are putting China, that's that's actually where the gunpowder tea is from, not where the meadow sweet is from. Yeah, so gunpowder tea has to come from Xingdang, the East Province of China. Okay, but he asked about the meadow sweet. Some of you are like you're you're almost on the way there, but you're not quite there yet. I've seen like a couple people who are super close. <laughs> I can't give you any hints, but you're really really close. I've seen a couple of right answers, and then a yeah. couple of and Dave, right Slim, you can't answer. Get out of there. Oh, okay. Get out of there, dude. Okay. All right, Amy, uh, Amy Stevens got that one. So Amy, you got that one. You are, you are not qualified to win any of the other ones, but you've got this one, you're golden. The answer was Jump Shambo and the Antelope. And I think I was first. It's not Antelope, it's the Jackalope. Jackalope. So, but, I think I was first, Donnie. <laughs> yeah, Dave, forget it, you're fired, you're out. No, uh, there's no way. Dave, if you got that right, you're gonna have serious chats. Yeah. Um, okay, Simon, go ahead and uh, ask ask your question. I'm going to have you do. Oh. Um, you've already done that. Oh, I'm going to have you do question number four, which is um, also a two parter. Um, so what was that question? Start start it me was off about, about your stills. I, I did I did I mention them? So so yeah. um, there are there there are two stills that make Ford's gin. Um, uh, what are their what are their names, and uh, what uh, how big are they? You, you did. I like how you asked. Um, that you asked whether or not you said it, and you did. <laughs> so so uh, Lee, you're super close. You just have to remember the amount, and you got it. So what? close. What's it? I'm going to give a clue. They, 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 they only make uh, 200 and to 205 liters of, of gin in every still run. So, but how big is the still? Uh, he just wrote small, which I don't think counts, but you know. yeah, that's pretty small. <laughs> that works. <laughs> we are small batch. <laughs> okay. They are a small batch. Okay. <laughs> I, I just need somebody to answer both of them, and then you got it. Yay! They're, you guys are super. You're super close. Okay, there we go. Bruce nailed it. Done. Thumbelina, Tom Thumb, five hundred liters. Done. Boom. There we go. Okay. All right, Bruce, we've got you on that one. Um, I'm going to ask the. Um, the four pillars question. And again, I'm showing you the wrong one here because oops, I'm showing you nothing. Um, again, this is the, the olive branch um, instead of the rare dry. But Donna popped on earlier and asked, what are the four pillars of four pillars? If you can name them all, you get it. That one was easy. She just came on, you know, through some, uh, you know, Australian uh, stuff at you and then you got it. Okay, perfect. Debbie Krangle, awesome. Nailed it. Fantastic. There we go. So 
there's our three winners. Um, you guys are going to get a, um, a, bo a bottle of the respective gin and the tidy martini kit, which is terrific. And sorry to, for keeping you guys so long, but we just, you know, our panel was very interesting today. Um, and again, they, they're they just so yearning for um, interactivity with other humans that <laughs> these things just tend to, tend to run long. But um, thank you guys so much. Uh, Connor, really appreciate you staying up late for us. Um, we know that it's your normal global hours, but we really appreciate it. Yeah. No, um, thanks, Danny, and thanks, everyone. Thanks for staying on. It's, uh, it was well worth staying up to 2 a.m. Um, yeah. Stay up is, for, to 3 and not, have another couple of martinis. But uh, There you go. Well, you've already pre-batched them, so it's not like you have to do any work. Uh, I've so, drank that. Oh, nice. Sorry. They're, they're gone. Um, and Simon, thank you. Welcome home. Glad you're back. Um, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. And of course, to the whole Shaker and Spoon family, to Alex Room over at Four Pillars. I hope he's feeling better and he'll watch this video later. To Dale DeGroff, congratulations on your creation of Ford's Gin. That's amazing. Um, and, and again, to everyone who joined us and just for making the Shaker and Spoon community such a great place to hang out. Um, we love seeing you guys and your ideas and your home bars and your cocktails and your feet at your pool and you know your snow pictures and keep sharing and um and have fun and we will see you all very soon